some pretty cheeky kids in my time in the church. The kid who stole one, just one of my brand new leather sandals, put it in the drinking fountain and turned it on. They never matched again, those shoes. The one kid who loved the pithy, sarcastic barb, loved to lob them at fellow youth groupers, but whose eyes would cloud with tears any time anyone dished it back. Little ones who discovered that they could scream, uh, and that insight seemed purposefully tied to the, the clincher of my sermon, which was now unheard. Kids who, having just heard a children's message about loving others, would return to their seat and slap their sister. That one was me. <laughs> the greatest in the kingdom, supposedly. I really hope that when Jesus had this kid on his lap, they picked their nose and wiped it on Jesus' robe. You know, something really kid-like, right? But Jesus doesn't laud their perfect wonder and curiosity any more than a child's ability to turn their parents' face beet red. Jesus lifts up their humility, their low estate, their helplessness. Imagine the future of someone who was a child in 30-ish AD. What would they inherit? By the time the child was, I don't know, just a little bit older than Jesus is at this point in the story, the Jewish-Roman wars would have commenced. They would have borne witness to the other destruction of everything familiar. But they wouldn't know it in this moment, as they folded into the Lord as only a child in a trusted lap can do, and laid their head upon his chest. They couldn't know of how utterly everything could fall apart. But knowing this future is to be reminded that underneath the humility of a child is an urgency that we ignore at their peril. They cannot affect the state of the planet that they will inherit, the country and its laws, the society and its norms. They are humble because they are utterly dependent on preceding generations to feel the necessary urgency, not just to do the right thing, but to do the difficult thing for the sake of those who will come after them. When Jesus says the greatest in the kingdom is a child, he is telling us exactly where to look for the kingdom among us, exactly where God is at work, in the urgent need of the humble and the least. It is apparently an easy thing, though, to ignore the humility and vulnerability of succeeding generations. David had no problem in, in ending their future completely. Politics is a dirty business filled with all kinds of decisions none of us really wants to make. David has to face facts. If he stays in Israel, Saul will kill him and likely the 600 men who have followed him and their wives and their children. If Saul has learned his lesson with the Amalekites, he will put this usurper under the ban and make an example of anyone who would attempt to coup the monarch of Israel. It is for that reason that David can't kill Saul, the anointed of God, after all. I mean, what value would David's monarchy be? And what safety he could, could he assure for himself or for his family if he assassinated Saul? So, David retreats to Gath, the home of Goliath, his foe of all places, to live among his enemies. Skillfully, he procures for his followers a new home, one David hopes is temporary and King Asich hopes is permanent. And day after day, David does the king's bidding, going out against the enemies of the Philistines. Unfortunately, there is a discrepancy about what, who that is exactly. Asich assumes that it's Israel, 
And so David tells him. But he is really going out against different tribes. Gershurites and Gerzites and Amalekites. And I have not done as great of a job as Kent did in pronouncing any of that. David is trying to save his own skin and his own people and their own children. And yet he massacres, we assume, the children of other tribes. Monarchy is a brutal business and children are merely collateral damage. And it's easy to write this off, right? To say it's just the way of things, to hide the realities of the past from ourselves, to justify brutality, violence, and destruction. In so doing, we retain our heroes, but we blind ourselves to the urgency of the future and the need for a new way for the sake of those who come after us. The writer Flannery O'Connor said, to know oneself is, above all, to know what one lacks. It is to measure oneself against truth and not the other way around. The first product of self-knowledge is humility. Of course, when I realize what I lack, I learn that I am not much different than the child being held in the lap of Jesus. I, too, have no real knowledge of what the future holds. I am prey to a despair that the future could be quite bleak. I have no sense of my own future, no confidence about the world that my children will inherit, but I know the future of the one who holds us all. I know the violence and destruction in Jesus' future. I know I will find him vulnerable, alone, and humiliated on a cross. And I know he will never leave me, he will never leave me alone in mine. The nature essayist Barry Lopez died in 2020 from complications of prostate cancer. And after his death, a collection of essays was published called Embrace Fearlessly the Burning World. The essays chronicle his work with Arctic foxes and learning from indigenous people, and they also tell heartbreakingly of Lopez's sexual abuse at the hands of a respected doctor. The stories belong together. The invisible suffering, the unspeakable violence, the utter vulnerability. We know that even now, the repercussions of our warming planet is born out on the young of every species. The need is urgent. Lopez writes, we must invent overnight, figuratively speaking, another kind of civilization, one more cognizant of limits, less greedy, more compassionate, less bigoted, more inclusive, less exploitive. This is the kingdom work to which we are called, urgently. Week after week, we prepare to welcome Christ in, with, and under bread and wine at this welcome table. And we sing, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. A fragment of a verse that also says, Hosanna to the son of David. The son of David. Jesus is from this line, brutal as it is. Jesus is heir to this throne, bloodied as it is. This is what he inherits. But when he is asked who is the greatest, he does not name David, nor Solomon, his son, nor any other well-known hero. He names someone filled with unknown potential, potential which will not be achieved if they cannot grow into adulthood. The greatest in the kingdom is the one for whom we will participate in God's way. The greatest in the kingdom is the most vulnerable among us, for whom our most faithful expression is hope. Hope that there is still a new way. Ruminating on the state of our planet, Barry Lopez asks, is it still possible to face the gathering darkness and say to the physical earth and to all its creatures, including ourselves, Fiercely and without embarrassment, I love you. 
and to embrace fearlessly the burning world. Look, Jesus holds on his lap a child, perhaps a different kind of child today than we expected. Perhaps instead an infant sequoia, seeds still nestled tight in its cone, waiting for the heat of a wildfire to unleash its potential growth, but who will not survive the burning of an entire planet. This is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so, beloved, let us attend to the future with a passionate urgency that in seeking out the vulnerable and humble, we might witness the kingdom of God in our midst. Amen.